you know, I've been able to help other women come out of this shame and embarrassment about being an alcoholic. And that to me is the greatest gift is to watch these other women get sober and be able to feel okay with who they are and that they're not bad people. We're human. And that's what I really, you know, want women and young girls to know that um, they don't have to hurt from this. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of TSP, The Share Podcast. And today we have Lori McGarvey joining us on the show. And Lori is the founder of Recovery Management Solutions. And in April of this year, Lori ran the Boston Marathon as a fundraiser for the Heron Project. It was called Project Purple. And the idea behind the Heron Project is to support and lead efforts in recovery from addiction, especially for teens. Now, when I interviewed Laurie, it was in March, and the idea was to try and get the episode out in April. And as you guys all know, I'm backed up at least a couple months before an episode goes out. So I'm really bummed I couldn't get this episode out in time to help support her efforts. Because Laurie is a woman driven by recovery today. And she has such a touching story, especially when we get to the part of her story when she starts talking about her father and how he played such an important role in her finding recovery. So without further ado, let's jump into Lori's story. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. Today's episode of the Share Podcast is brought to you by Addiction Unscripted. AddictionUnscripted.com is one of the leading online publishers of addiction recovery content. They publish relevant, timely, high-quality stories on a daily basis, covering everything from news and opinion segments to personal narratives from those affected by addiction. But that's not even the best part. Addiction Unscripted is a publication made up of nearly all user-generated content. What that means is that Addiction Unscripted is more than a publication. It's a community of people touched by addiction and a major platform that allows people to write or share on the subject of addiction or recovery while reaching the over 250,000 people who visit their site every month. Addiction Unscripted founder Matt Mendoza says, Our goal is to normalize the stories of brokenness that derive from addiction and to help match the stories that people need to tell with the people who need to hear them. Addiction Unscripted is also currently running their first ever Voices and Recovery Challenge and invites you to participate. There are two $500 prizes at stake, so if you are a voice in recovery and you want the chance to win $500, visit addictionunscripted.com for more information on the Voices in Recovery Challenge. Make sure to submit your story today. Okay, guys, another quick reminder that... I will be at the Seattle International Narcotics Anonymous Convention this year, July 29th, 30th, and 31st, 2016. It will be held at the Seattle Airport Marriott, and I will be the main speaker on Friday night opening up the convention. If you go to the Share Podcast website, on the right-hand side of the website, you'll see a banner. It's a blue banner that says SINAC 2016. Click on that banner. It'll send you to the page where you have information about room rates, about registering for the convention. Everything you need to know about attending the convention is right on that website. So again, I would love to meet you guys in person. If you can make it out there, would love to see you. Okay, guys, first of all, thanks so much for everyone who has helped support the Share Podcast. And for those of you listening who would like to know how you can help support the Share Podcast, let me give you a couple of ideas. First of all, the most important one, which is absolutely free, is to leave a rating and review on iTunes. iTunes single-handedly is one of the most powerful ways for people to find the Share Podcast. So to make it easy for you guys, what I've done is I've put buttons on the website, www.thesharepodcast.com. Go there on the right-hand side. The very first button reads, subscribe on iTunes. Click on that button. It's going to send you directly to the iTunes podcast app. And from there, you'll click subscribe and then go to the section that says rate and review. 
and please leave us a five-star rating. There's no question about it. iTunes is one of the best ways for our listeners to find the Share podcast, especially when they're searching for it on Google. If you don't have an iPhone, then go to Stitcher Radio. It's the banner right underneath the subscribe on iTunes. Click on that and do the exact same thing. Subscribe and then leave a five-star rating and review. There's no question about it. This is the best way for you to show your support. I also want to thank all the listeners who have been clicking on the Amazon banner ad. Folks, for those of you wondering what's another fantastic way to support the show is by clicking on that banner before you shop on Amazon. You're going to shop on Amazon anyway. It's not going to cost you one penny more, and it kicks back some commission to the Share Podcast We've already seen a dramatic increase in commission since we added the banner ad. So thanks again, guys. It's helping so much. And as far as being of service, you can also go to the website and click on the Join the Facebook Private Group banner. It'll take you right to the Facebook Private Group where you can request to be added and do some service. There's newcomers in there that are posting daily, old-timers sharing experience, strength, and hope. It's an absolutely beautiful way to contribute to your own recovery as well as to those in the community. So plug yourself in, get into that private Facebook group. It's absolutely thriving. And again, it's a wonderful way for everyone to be of service. And of course, I want to give a big thank you to all of the listeners who have continued to give donations every month. Thank you guys so much for your generous donations. And for those of you that would like to contribute and help grow and support the Share Podcast financially, you can go to the website, click on the Donate with PayPal button, and it'll take you to the page where you can make your donation. And for those of you that use Sober Grid or are looking for an app on their phone where you can find meetings, have a sobriety calculator, connect privately with members of your local recovery community, or when you travel, connect with members in recovery in order to find a meeting, then you might as well join the private alumni group for Share Podcast listeners. So go into the Sober Grid menu once you've registered. Scroll down to where it says alumni group, click on add group and type in S-H-A-I-R and the Share Podcast alumni group will pop right up. And for those of you who would like to know which are the most popular podcast episodes, there is a banner on the right hand side of the page as you scroll down that says most popular podcast episodes. Click on that banner and it will take you to the page that features the most popular podcast episodes based on listener feedback and number of downloads. And for those of you who would like a list of all the books that have been recommended by our guests, go to the right-hand side of the website and click on the banner that says Recommended Books. It'll take you right to the page where we have a list of all the recommended books. And finally, I want to give credit to the Share Podcast team that is instrumental in producing the Share Podcast, Zinzi Gugu and Evelyn E., who handle the audio editing for each podcast episode, Omar Hernandez, that does all the social media cover art, and Krista Wojo, who handles all of our social media marketing. Without this amazing team, there's no way I could have continued to produce the podcast every week. Thank you, guys. I couldn't do this without you. So let's dive into this week's episode. But first, a quick message from our sponsors. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line, which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www SoberNation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. And finally, would you like to receive the most popular AA daily devotions free in one distribution? Transitions Daily delivers daily devotions from the 24 hours a day, AA thought for the day, daily reflections, big book quote, just for today, as Bill sees it, plus more. You can get our distribution daily via email, private Facebook group, or Twitter. Go to daily aaemails.com for more information. And don't forget to share daily aaemails.com with friends in meetings and with sponsees in recovery. Now back to the show. Hey, Laurie, thanks for joining us. 
Hi, O. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show today. How are you feeling? Actually, a little sore. I had to do my hill workout today, but other than that, I feel good. <laughs> All right, let's get started then. Okay, folks, so today we have Lori McGarvey joining us on the Share Podcast, and she is the founder of Recovery Management Solutions. And Lori is currently fundraising for the Heron Project for this Boston 2016 marathon. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, excellent. All right, so <laughs> let's dive right in here. Tell us about how your life is today, because I'm, I'm assuming it's very busy. So give us your daily routine and how you squeeze in recovery. Okay. Well, let me just say that for me, this alcoholic recovery is my routine. So everything that I do, you know, whether it's from when I get up in the morning, I get down on my knees and I say, you know, God's will, not mine be done today. Mm -hmm. And that's how I, I have to move. And when I don't stay with that routine, you know what, quite honestly, I get negative. That's not who I've learned to be. So I really try and stick with my you know, daily routine of prayer and some type of, I'm not real good at meditating because it's tough for me to sit still. So I try and you know do more of a walking and gratitude list even before I kind of move into the day and get into the workplace. And I have two kids. I have a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a dog, and they're very active so, you know, I try and keep something like I use my phone a lot and I keep everything, all my devotionals, all things like that. And I kind of work through it throughout the day. I've learned to pause before I go into situations and it allows me to be who God needs me to be in that space rather than, you know, thinking about me and my ego. Got it. Absolutely. I totally got it. Well, my next question was going to be, how do you maintain your spiritual condition, the conscious contact with your higher power? But it looks like you already got that covered. You know what? Yes, I have. <laughs> I was taught well. However, I get stuck. I get stuck a lot. And I'll be honest, I've been stuck the past couple of days and I'm fighting my way back to my higher power. And it's ironic that I happen to be doing this particular talk with you on this day, but I, God has a reason for everything. You know, there's a page in the big book that I live out of. I'll say, this is really how I live out of page 417. And it talks about acceptance. Mm -hmm. Acceptance is the answer to all our problems. There are no mistakes in God's world. And you know, this alcoholic will resist reading that page and keep herself miserable for a good 48 hours. And then finally, I'll just say, you know what? I'm just going to read the page and everything goes and the spirit comes back. But you know, I'm still rebellious. Seven years sober and I'm still rebellious. So <laughs> uh, I just say to myself, Laurie, keep coming back. <laughs> so why in particular today? What you got going on right now that's so pressing? I made a transition in August. I took a new job. I was traveling globally and I'm a, um, a management trainer and coach, and I took a job where there's no travel, home all the time, and I'm at a, back at a university, and I used to be the dean of a college when I was not sober, but I'm back at a university. So I think it takes me a while to get settled and, you know, starting a new job, not knowing people, you know, brought back a lot of the insecurities that I had. Mm, yeah. And here's what it was. I realized it was the first new job I had since I got sober. Actually, it's the first job I've ever had where I've been sober the whole time. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to tell the truth. So, and hopefully I tell the truth these days. And I know God's asking me to slow down. Yeah. And it's hard for me because you know what? When you slow down, all of a sudden you think about something. So it's forced me to do some things. I have to step up my meetings. And I have to go back regularly and see my sponsor. And one of the things that I've always done since I would say going into year two, once I found him and he took me through the steps, he knows absolutely everything about me, is that I pretty faithfully had gone for the past four years or so, you know, every Friday morning at 630 in the morning because I wasn't traveling then. And we would read 
or we would check in. And that's my accountability checkpoint. With all this transition, I stopped doing that. Mm. And all of a sudden, I felt really off my spiritual foundation. Like I felt like I was just swimming in uncharted territories. And I'm not a negative thinker since I've been sober, but like this negativity was coming back. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. This is just not who God wants me to be. So little by little, I'm getting back. And sometimes when I'm asked to speak, and I do, it's always at a time when something had been going on. And I realize that I have to stay connected to where I came from. Yes. What caused it? And, you know, reach out to people and ask for help. You know, another thing that, oh, you know, I dread to do because I'm supposed to know it all. But so I asked for help and say, you know what, I'm struggling now. And I called a girlfriend today and she like right away knew everybody, like we know what to say to each other. And it goes, it's like this air let out of a balloon and you feel like, okay, you know, I'm not alone. You know, this is my new normal. Right. Absolutely. No, I get it. I get it. You know, for those that are listening, there's a lot of newcomers that listen to the podcast. And, you know, even with seven years of sobriety, we have to have that conscious contact. Always. One way or another, you're going to get to a point where you recognize that something is missing, something is wrong. And then you just have to go back to, you know, your steps, you know, one, two, three, and then find your footing. So it, it's a beautiful message for anyone because at the end of the day, you know, it's okay to disconnect, but you got to find your way back and you have to have a network that you can reach out to just like you do. Oh, absolutely. And I will say that I have, just had an unbelievable network of people. I mean, cause it is a mutual, you know, it's all mutual. I mean, it's not just about taking. And, um, one of the greatest things that I learned very early on with my sponsor, he said, you know, when you go to meetings, I want you to listen for something. He said, I want you to listen to the relapse stories, Laurie, mm-hmm. that's what I want you to listen to. And, you know, so I did, you know, you get that feeling. It's just so clear when you've been away from a substance for a while and you just know something's not right. They say that slippery slope. Like Mm -hmm. I, I know what that feels like. (laughs) I know what that feels like. And I also am grateful that I also know that there's something I can tap into. Yes, absolutely. I've really been blessed that way. You know, and the other thing is, you know, I've been able to help other women come out of this shame and embarrassment about being an alcoholic. And that to me is the greatest gift is to watch these other women get sober and be able to feel okay with who they are and that they're not bad people. We're human. And that's what I really, you know, want women and young girls to know that um, they don't have to hurt from this. There is hope. There is. There absolutely is. I think it's really hard to think about that. Like I think about when my very first day when I went into, you know, an AA room. I mean, I knew for a long time. Well, let's get into that. Let's get into that because you're jumping in already. So first, tell us how much clean time you have and when's your anniversary date? Okay. So I have, by the grace of God, I have seven years and my anniversary date is actually my son's birthday, June 13th. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. So June 13th, what year is that? 2008. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So now I'm going to turn this show over to you, Laurie. It's time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life, when you hit rock bottom, and then finally your journey into recovery up until today. So Laurie, take it away. Okay. All right. You know, I have to say this. This is how I always start. You know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share And uh, the only reason why I truly want to share is that it helps someone else feel worthy and gives them an opportunity to know that there is healing and it's available for them, regardless of what's going on. My story, my experience is that, um, you know, I grew up in a family where my father was an alcoholic and we didn't talk about it. And I always remember, my mother always tells a story that when I was in fourth grade, we must have been learning about alcohol. 
I looked at her in the kitchen and I said, mom, I think dad's an alcoholic. And she said, oh, Lori, why would you say that? And I'm like, well, I was learning in school that like, if you drink in the morning, that's a sign of alcoholism. <laughs> like nothing else was said. <laughs> so that was a sign of something. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, and I'll say this at this point. What's I really crazy is that I ended up as a morning drinker. Mm. You know, if you have thoughts about, you know, is this genetic? Is it not? You know, that's just a debate in and of itself. But you know what? I came by it honestly. And as I went through my own life in high school, it was just something that, you know, everybody did. And it was fun. And I didn't worry about things. I wasn't worried so much about whether or not I was going to fit in. And then I went to college and I had a heck of a time. I mean, I had an absolute wonderful escapades after escapade after escapade and did not know that at the time that was not normal behavior for somebody. When I finished and then I you know, went to graduate school, I didn't do a whole lot of drinking in graduate school for whatever reason. And then, you know, after graduate school, got married and um, just started to feel very uncomfortable in my own skin and didn't feel like I had made the right decision, you know, you know, to get married. And it was just, it was awful to get rid of my awful. I would have a glass of wine, mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't regular drinking. But I ended up, uh, you know, I married somebody who, you know, is a fireman and he was a Marine. So drinking is very much, you know, part of, you know, that lifestyle, that oh, culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought I went to heaven really for a while because I could, you know, drink. But I was not a normal drinker. I don't think I ever was a normal drinker. So that's really when it started to progress. And it was just such a part of everything we did. And I felt comfortable for the most part, in my own skin. Although it was then when I was able to get pregnant, I had had a miscarriage and that again, you know, had gotten depressed and, you know, drank my way through that. But then I did get pregnant and I didn't drink. However, I was like a cat on a hot tin roof. I didn't realize until after I got sober that why I was like a cat on a hot tin roof was because I was not drinking mm. and I had no program. Right. And so, you know, when that little munchkin made her way into the world, she was 10 weeks old and I found out I was pregnant again and I couldn't give up the alcohol. And so I made a deal with my doctor. And I said, listen, I did some research with all these, you know, famous women who had a couple drinks when they were pregnant. Like, this is the kind of insanity. And I said, you know, can I just have two glasses of wine a day? And he said, you know what, Laura, what do you think? Maybe we should, I don't know, call AA. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yo, bud, I'm not the alcoholic. It's my father and the family. I got this. And he's like, well, AA is really good in case, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I did controlled drinking and I have this incredible, he's 12 now, this incredible, by the grace of God, incredible young boy, you know, his name is Jack. But when I was in the hospital after Jack was born, I wanted to get out of that hospital so bad, but I didn't want to go out of the hospital because I wanted to bring this wonderful baby home. Mm. Okay. I wanted to get out of this hospital because I wanted to get on the back porch and drink. Because my insides, my head, I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown. And so I suffered from postpartum and had to go back to work. I was the dean of a college at the time. So I went back to work like two weeks, three weeks after he was born. And the anxiety was getting worse and worse and worse. And so I would have a glass of wine absolutely every day. And I would, you know, get home. And uh, that lasted for five years till he turned five. And in that time, I got divorced. I, the only thing I was faithful to was my vodka. And uh, I needed that more than I needed anything. 
And it became, you know, there's a part in the big book and it says, you know, alcohol had become my master. And oh boy, when I read that line after I got sober, I knew exactly what that meant. I knew exactly what it felt like. And, you know, whether it's with the way women are, they metabolize, I'm not sure what, but like it was a hurricane for about five years, tornado, tsunami, and I took everybody down with me. Like getting involved with me when I was drinking was like polishing the rails of the Titanic. (laughs) And that is the absolute truth. Yeah. And there was, you know, towards the end, I slowly, like, it was like, I could feel that I had no more soul. Like I was going to give up everything. And I have to tell you, this is, you know, a lot of people have really, I mean, I just heartfelt like this is, this is what happened at my bottom. But what got me to the decision that I probably shouldn't drink was um, I rented out a room in the place I was living, you know, to make extra money, I guess. And uh, in a blackout and I didn't remember it. And the next thing you know, these people were getting ready to rent, show up at the door. And I was like, yeah, it's been rented. And I had, you know, like, I was just like, this has got to stop. I can't do this anymore. And uh, we were having my son's fifth birthday at my ex-husband's house. And uh, my dad, who was not sober at the time, he looked at me and he said, Laurie, what's the matter? And I looked at him and for the first time in my life, I spoke truth very softly. But I said, Dad, I'm an alcoholic. And this was at the birthday party. He didn't say anything. You know, he hugged me goodbye that night, called me the next day, said, Laura, what are we going to do about this? And I said, I don't know. I can't take off work. You know, I'm just not going to take off work. And um, he said, we'll do this. Why don't you meet me on Sunday, which happened to be Father's Day at 415 and just meet me. So I was like, okay. So 415 rolls around. I meet him like I said I would. And he took me to my very first AA meeting. And I remember the baseball cap I had on. And I remember feeling like, oh, my God, my life is over. But then there was another part of me that felt like I belonged. And that started the journey. And it was awful and scary. And I never knew from one day to the next. But I landed myself in this there was this meeting and it was seven days a week at 7 a.m. Because I remember what someone said to me early on. They're like, you know, if you're serious about this, you have to be as committed to your recovery as you were to your addiction. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to be doing this 24 hours a day with these people <laughs> because that's how I drank. So it was like 7 a.m. that replaced my vodka. And then probably like one of the greatest days was when this other woman who had like 10 years sober talked about when she would get up and get her vodka out of the freezer. And I turned around in the meeting. I was like, oh, like I felt like I'd come home, you know, like I, I, I did that. Like there's somebody else in the world that did that, you know, and they just embraced me and loved me and loved me until, you know, I could start to, I won't say love myself, but want to hang out with myself, you know, I'm still learning to love myself, but you know, but I went a year. Okay. And I was miserable again. It's like my skin was crawling and I was making bad decisions. And, you know, my mother said to me, you know what, you're not drinking, but you're still acting like an alcoholic. <laughs> so, you know, I, I prayed. I, and of course I had a resentment of course. You know, with her. Cause you know, I was never good enough. I was never good enough for her anyway. You know, so, but I finally prayed and I said, oh God, you know, if there's anything like that, you can, like, I can't go through this anymore. Like, this is craziness. And so I went over this course of three days, I went to three different meetings, right? And there was one guy either chairing or speaking at the meeting. And I looked up in the sky and I said, dear God, please let this man not be the answer (laughs) that you're giving me. Because I knew of his reputation and he took women through the steps. I thought, oh my God, like, this is it. Like the jig is up. I'm going to have to get beyond honest. And so I went up to him thinking like, I'm just going to see like, you know, he says Monday, 730. And he's like, yeah, just bring the big book. 
Monday, 7.30. And he's this little old Italian man. His name is Nick. And I went every day and we did it, you know, the way he was taught. And we went through the big book and we went through the steps. And like, you know, when you get to that place of the fourth step, I looked up at him because I looked at the, you know, that's how it's laid out in the columns and so forth. And I looked at him and I just started bawling because I just couldn't stop. And he looked at me and he said, you don't have to do this by yourself. Cause I was so afraid I was going to leave something out. And then that would cause me to slip in the future. And, you know, I finally just found someone that I was willing to be honest with and listen to, you know, I never listened, really listened. And so, you know, he took me through and it took a really long time. He told me never to compare myself with what anybody's other steps were like and, what I remember is he said, look, Gloria, this is about prayer and service. He goes in these steps. First, you get right with God. Then you get right with self. And then you get right with the other people. He said, so let's just take it one step at a time. And I was able to do that. And uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but also the most rewarding In the long run, I just can't say enough about what those steps have done for me and my family for that matter. Of course, you know, you know, when that was finished and and like I said, it really took me a long time, you know, then it was like my turn to help other people. And I said to him, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I didn't sign up for that. I said, I'm good. And he's like, yeah, no, that's not how it works. You know, it's your turn to give back. And I said, well, no one's asked me for anything. And uh, because I am not a good, I'm not good with commitment. I'm not good with relationships, blah, blah, blah. And I said, listen, I'll make a deal with you. If God puts someone in my life, I'm absolutely going to do what you did with me and take them through the steps. I'm leaving this up to God. I kid you not. Three weeks later, someone said to me, do you think you could help me? And uh, I need a sponsor. And I didn't even like that word. I was like, oh, my God, you know, because then the responsibility for people and then you got to be in relation with them. Like I thought, no, no. So sure enough, it started with one. And, you know, it's a mirror. It ends up being a mirror. And all the things that were still like that I needed to look at were coming up as we we're sitting across from one another reading the big book like yeah. Bill W. and Bob did, you know, well, Mm -hmm. they didn't have the big book, but, you know, and I was like, and then one thing led to another and I started to become the woman that God intended me. Because one thing I do know is that, and this is another thing my mother always used to say, apparently when I was in the eighth grade, I won the humanitarian award and it was like compassion and all this other stuff. And when I was in my, the throes of my drink, and she would say, oh, my God, but she won the humanitarian award in eighth grade. Like, and I never understood that. But I <laughs> when I got sober, I know it's I know I'm crazy. <laughs> but when I got sober, that's really I do have a lot of compassion and empathy. And I can be with someone through pain. None of that would have been possible had I not gone through those steps. And you don't go through them just once. I mean, it's a way of living. It's a way of living. There's a book that was given to me after I had gone through the steps. I mean, I've had so many books, good books recommended. There's a book, it's called How to Breathe Underwater, The Spirituality of the 12 Steps. And this author, Richard Rohr, ended up, he's this, I don't know, Franciscan and where his church was, they must've been having AA meetings and they invited him in and he was just blown away, blown away. And, you know, the steps are for everybody. And even now in the work that I do as a management trainer and coach, I find that I can bring that into my work world and share with people, you know, aspects of the steps that help them get through some of the everyday things you know, letting go acceptance with all the change that's gone on, you know, in corporate here and there. So, you know, that book was very, very, very powerful, you know, for me. And, you know, that leads me to after I was sponsoring people for a while, I ended up having to travel like all the time for work. And, uh, I found 
the headquarters of the company I was working for was in Dublin, Ireland. And I'll tell you what, I love to go there. I had to go several times a year and I have a home group there. And I happened to be there on my anniversary one year and they had this big anniversary celebration. You know, AA is global and I've been in non-English speaking meetings and it's just, it's everywhere. And I, no matter where I went around the world, I felt at home, but it was because of AA and those 12 steps. Right. And it really, it's just unbelievable. And that's why, you know, when people get fearful when they're traveling and, you know, things like that, but all we have to do is, you know, it's about being proactive. So I always looked in advance. So I was really good about that. And then, you know, life starts to get like, oh, you know, things are good. And, you know, my ex-husband and I, we worked a situation where we're able to be together, you know, to protect the family unit and uh, took a lot of forgiveness, but we've developed a partnership and we're going to get the kids to college. And, you know, that's all God. That's all God in the 12 steps because that doesn't happen to people. It very rarely happens to people. Yes. Um, and we did not get remarried, but our commitment is, you know, to the children, to the family unit. And we've created a partnership that I believe was God inspired. So it got, you know, comfortable. And occasionally I think I know something. So I wasn't as vigilant as I had been, you know, going to meetings and so forth. And then as I was traveling, what happened was at the end of the day, I needed to unwind. So I. I was always in hotels and I just decided to get on and I always worked out, walked, but I never ran. So I guess this was, this would have been about two years ago, two and a half years ago. So I decided to get on a treadmill and next thing you know, I'm running. And someone said to me about doing a 5k and I was like, yeah, okay. So I did a 5k and then I did a, I don't know, 10k and then a 10 miler. And I could see how it was changing me. And I thought, you know what, this is like a good option for people in recovery. Like, I wonder if there's like running groups for people in recovery or, you know, so I couldn't find anything or I didn't come across anything. So I ended up remembering that over seven years ago, I used to sit on a bar stool and say, yo, I'm going to run a marathon. (laughs) And of course, you know, seven, eight vodka and tonics deep. You know, there was no marathon happen. The only marathon that was happening was that I was on drinking marathon. Yep. That was it. Okay. And it was definitely more than 26.2 miles. <laughs> so I ended up doing this marathon because I was seven years sober and I wanted to recognize, you know, my sobriety, honor my sobriety in that way. But I still felt like it was ego driven. And that's a scary place for me. So on the way back from my marathon, which I finished in just about five hours and my sister was driving me back and I was looking up runners in recovery, this and that. And I came across this thing called the Heron project. And it was founded by this NBA guy who was, you know, an alcoholic and then a heroin addict. So I emailed them for information and literally, and I told them like, I just an hour ago finished my first marathon. I'm seven years sober. And I did this because God, got me sober. And, and I, I just was like speechless. This woman contacted me back. Her name's Pam. And she's like, we'd love to have you as a part of our group. So I was watching, you know, this group and they're on Facebook. And then this opportunity came up about the Boston marathon. And she said, do you think you'd be interested? And it's a very big fundraising commitment. You have to raise $7,500 and, but every dollar goes towards someone who needs something in addiction. So I was like, you know what? Absolutely. So I got rejected first and I said to her, I said, I'm not upset because if I'm meant to do the Boston marathon, if God wants me to do it, I'm going to do it. It's just how it works in my life. Yep. Okay. So right before Christmas, get the call. We have a bib and we'd like to offer it to you. Are you willing to commit? Now here's me like anti-commitment USA. I'm like, absolutely. I will absolutely commit to fundraising. I will absolutely train. (laughs) you know, and I'm doing it and I've got three weeks left and here we are. I mean, I have to tell you, I'm in this group. There's six or seven of us. And like the other woman that I'm running with her son is, and I've never met these people, by the way, never met them. Her son's eight months clean off heroin. And it was the heroin project 
that flew him to where he needed to get treatment. You know, like the dollars go. Yes. Directly. And, you know, I can support that. I can support that. So, you know, I've given a lot of my own money. I have actually started a nonprofit called Recovery Management Solutions because my goal is, see, I don't feel right about taking money in terms of coaching people in recovery because it was not that way for me. So what I'd like to do is with my nonprofit is to create funding opportunities this way. If anybody doesn't want to go through a traditional 12 steps, but they know that they need help and particularly the families, I just want people to have a place to go and get a resource and not be charged for it because, you know, not everybody wants to go into an AA room. And I, I recognize that. I think, you know, eventually maybe they will, but in, you know, there's still a lot of shame. So I try, at least in my community, to be very open about myself, about, you know, my alcoholism and, you know, my recovery. And I'm happy, you know, and I can be available to people. And I have a lot of, you know, women and men who, you know, offer support and volunteer so when we get, we're, you know, ideally we, and I'm working with a couple different people, ideally we'd like to have a center that has programs and recovery for like emotional, spiritual, physical, you know, intellectual, because I, I'm hoping to host a race to raise funds for this next year called Sober Sneakers. And we do a 5k every year for people who are in recovery. Cause I think it can be, you know, a run walk. It doesn't have to be running and all this other business, but you know what? It's all connected. So I think you start to feel good about yourself when you can be moving around. Yes. So, so that's pretty much my story, I guess. I Uh, mean, it truly is one day at a time. Truly, 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 truly. Well, I think for all of us, it needs to be that simple. It needs to be one day at a time. We all just have that daily reprieve you know, based on our conscious contact with a higher power and our connection with recovery, which is something that, you know, since you came in has been, you know, uh, such a strong anchor for you. It doesn't seem like you relapsed, correct? No, I didn't. Once you came in, you were done. Yeah. And so here's something I'm curious about, because I know that when you were younger, you talk about how you recognize that your father is an alcoholic, right? Yeah. And so you mentioned that when you hit rock bottom, your dad was the one that took you to your first meeting. I know it. Oh, I forgot the best part. Get in there. Okay. So I'm 30 days sober and knock at my door and it's my dad. And he said, I'm done. And I'm like, what do you mean you're done? He said, you've grown more in 30 days than I've grown in 30 years. And he's been sober. So we actually have, I mean, it's just like it started this domino effect in our family. (laughs) And he's like my best friend. Totally. He just turned 70 this year. He's like totally my best friend. And we go to AA meetings together. It's like heaven. Little slice of heaven. Oh, my God. His name's Bill, by the way. Oh, my God. How could you not have that in your story? (laughs) I know. Well, you know what? I'm old. Okay, I'm like going to be 49 in August, so I forget something. (laughs) That's all I kept thinking about was when you said that, I go, wait a minute, dad's an alcoholic. All right, and he's taking you to a meeting. So, do we miss something here? Did he already get sober? Right. So, you know, and what I really want to say about that is that, you know, that was the first time because my dad and I didn't have it easy, well, being together. But you know what? I realized after I was sober a few years that I felt unconditional love from him for the very first time because he didn't love himself enough to get sober and to take me to AA, but he believed in AA for me, his daughter. And I forgot to say that tonight, but you know what? That's really important because that was the way he demonstrated unconditional love to me. He took me when it wasn't working for him. He still took me. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. And this is not the first time I've heard this same story just from a different person where it happened by accident. Uh, There was another one. Steve recently told his story. And 
full blown alcoholic for many, many years. And then his son develops, you know, an addiction. And so he makes a deal with his son that he'll go to a meeting if he goes to a meeting, right? Uh, that was that whole dynamic where God was working for him, right? Where, you know, he couldn't do it for himself, but he could do it for his son. And it's no different than what was going on with your dad. You know, inherently he knew there was a solution. And, you know, watching your daughter suffering through the same thing you're suffering through, has got to be such a horrific, painful experience, trapped in your own body, trapped in your own mind, trapped with this disease. And then you're watching it happen to your daughter. And uh, the beautiful thing is that, that he got sober with you. That is like amazing. Oh, yeah. It really is such a gift. I mean, you know, when they say beyond your wildest dreams, like that's absolutely beyond my wildest dreams. It's healed our family. My parents are divorced, but I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And we all like, it just, it really anchored and the healing and the forgiveness started to happen. It was really beautiful. And I really am so grateful for my family. And I needed every drop of alcohol. I needed every drop in order to get to that level of humility to say, you know what, I'm done. I'm just done. I didn't want to live, but I didn't want to die, you know? It's that in-between awful space. And so your dad, 30 years drinking, and so you grew up in a household where your dad was an alcoholic. What was that like in your teen years? In your teen years, you know, what kind of feelings and emotions were going on with you when you were watching this? Or was he able to keep this under wraps? Oh, no. And I just was judgmental, self-righteous, how this is ridiculous. I had everything, you know, how could you act like this? How could you drink like this? And I ended up doing absolutely everything, but he did. So how old were you the first time you drank alcohol? Oh, I probably was 15. Okay. All right. So all this stuff had been going on. And so tell us about that first time. Tell us about, you know, that first drink and how it made you feel and the the whole story behind that first drink. I remember it was in the summer and it was at a splash party. We were members at this swim club. And so they used to have these things called splash parties. And, uh, you know, of course there was alcohol in my house. So me and a couple of my girlfriends and we decided that we were going to just get some alcohol and drink it and then go to the splash party. And that's exactly what we did. And, you know, I got sick and I mean, I remember it from what they tell me, but I was one of those, you know, types of drinkers. And, uh, but yet I went back for more, you know, to me, that's where I think to myself, you know, I had the inclination, I had the disposition that kind of lent itself to that. So it was just, you know, because it does, it takes away it for me, even though I got sick and I didn't remember things like I didn't care. I'd have to say that I just didn't care. Like whatever, because it was all about me. (laughs) I felt good. So whatever. And I mean, it's when I talk about this now, I feel like I'm talking about this woman that I knew and it's me that I'm talking about. Because it's so drastic, you know, the difference, so drastic in what it can do for somebody if you kind of lean into what recovery can offer you, you know, lean in as best you can, you know, why me? Like, why do I have to, why can everybody else drink and I can't, you know, we go through that. And, and unfortunately, you know, my ex-husband still drinks. So there are occasions where I am around alcohol and, you know, I have a really good network. I have a good network and, you know, I, I hold myself, you know, accountable and I'm very open with, you know, my children about the fact that, you know, we have alcoholism in our family and we have to be mindful of that. And I don't ever, ever, ever want them to feel ashamed right? or that they're going to get in trouble. And they know, they know parts of my story that were appropriate for them to know. Like, I think that's what, my mom was afraid of, oh gosh, you know, 
we can't let on that this goes on in our family. And that was generational. It just, you wouldn't talk about those things. But I think now we have opportunity to use social media in a good way to allow people to feel like they can share their pain and their hurt and feel like they're not going to get put down or in trouble for it. Absolutely. No question about it. That's exactly what's happening right now. And, uh, you know, how old were the kids when you got sober? I guess they were four and five going on five and six. Okay. All right. Well, your ex-husband's still currently drinking. So were the kids affected at that time enough to where they would say something to you? No, they have very little recollection of me drinking. That's beautiful. That's yeah. I mean, that's very a, fortunate. I know. I know. And I think my daughter struggles with um, when my ex-husband drinks, but we talked about it. You know, I believe in it takes a village. So I have people in recovery who, you know, my daughter trusts that she can talk to because it's they don't always want to talk to their parent. So I have key people in the community that, you know, my children know that they can talk to at any time because they need to let things out. Again, I believe in being proactive. I believe that, you know, prayer is absolutely, I cover my kids in prayer all the time. Absolutely. No, that's fantastic. And now things have shifted in an entirely different direction. You've, you know, seven years later, now you've got this big project going on that's going to be on uh, the Boston Marathon is on April 18th. So it's just around the corner. And how do you feel? You feel ready? You know what? I feel like this is what God wants me to do. And whether I'm ready or not, it's going to happen. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) And I have, I only suffered one injury in training so far. I have a broken toe, but they just told me to tape it. And I taped it. And so we're just going to keep going. And here's what I say. Look, if it were the vodka, I'd run with broken legs, arms. So I'm going to run. Do you know what I mean? Like I would (laughs) have ran to who knows where to get alcohol. So I can do this with a broken toe. Absolutely. How are the donations coming? They're good. You can always use, you know, more donations. So I have this goal where I've been, and so far this past few days I've been successful. So I've been just trying to raise a hundred dollars a day. So that might be four people who give 25, two people that give 50. I do have people that will give a hundred or 200, depending on, you know, what they're capable of. And it really comes down to everybody seems to be affected in some way, maybe not directly, but in and around addiction at some point. And, you know, the work of the Heron Project really does speak for itself. They're He goes around and speaks. He spoke at a lot of the high schools in our area and the kids. I mean, he gives out his phone number to the kids that are struggling. Tell us a little bit about Chris. Well, he was this unbelievable high school basketball athlete, cocky and gorgeous and just attitude all over the place. And what he says is, you know, they would bring in, you know, speakers and they would talk about, you know, don't drink, don't do this, don't do that. And he'd be like, yeah, whatever, whatever. And then they go and they go down on a Friday night in somebody's basement and they drink and they go to the basketball games. And that's how he did things. And, you know, as he got into the top colleges, got a scholarship and lost the scholarship in the same year. Because he went into things, you know, progressed into, you know, cocaine and then IV drug using. He'd relapse and then, you know, go back. And then he was drafted by, I believe it was the Denver Nuggets. And I think it was a couple of months and he was let go from that. I mean, this was the, and, you know, had married his high school sweetheart. They had a few children together and he was, I mean, heroin took him, you know, down. He was pretty much at the end on the street. You know, he had been in rehab and he came out of rehab to go see the birth of his third child and held the baby and said to his wife, you know what? I'll be back. I'm just going to go outside and get some fresh air. And it was in that instant he went, 
and met his dealer and right away got the heroin and then off to the races again, as they said. And then someone, you know, gave him that last, you know, putting out that last arm and saying, you know what, we've been where you are, you know, let us help you. Cause he had nothing, absolutely nothing. Right. And he realized that in losing everything, what he's able to give back now. And he's so passionate about these kids, so passionate. And he has like, not only the Heron project, but he also has hoop dreams, which is where he runs basketball camp for kids that want to play basketball. And he, you know, educates them in that way. So he's devoted his life to recovery and he went through the 12 steps goes, still goes to meetings and, uh, Just a really, I believe, you know, there's a lot of athletes, professional athletes out there, you know, that the kids just love, love, love. And I thought to myself, wow, here's a professional athlete who I would be extremely happy if my children said, you know, I love this guy. Like, that's who I admire. There's a tremendous number of heroes in recovery. We're starting to hear about them. And I think I see people like what you're doing with this show. I thought like how incredibly powerful that is for people to be able to listen in that, you know, this is what happens when, you know, people who were just down and out for a long time, when they're given an opportunity to heal, you want to give back when you heal, you want to give back. And I just think it, we're at a very critical time in life, in the world, with everything that goes on. And I think that in what I've learned, we can add value in a way where people feel worthy of getting sober. Amen, sister. Ah. <laughs> it's true. It's I a know. beautiful story. And there's so many reasons why people stay hidden behind that veil of anonymity. And for some, it's shame. For some, it's the traditions. You know, for some, it's uncertainty. But the truth is that there's so many people out there that are suffering. And now, just by going to their keyboard and typing in a few words... They come in contact with so many different forms of help, whether, like you say, it's through a podcast, it's through a blog search, it's through a community, it's through fundraising, it's through marathons, it's through outreach programs, all revolving around bringing awareness to addiction, what it does to people and you know how to prevent it. And so you know, if we're able to discuss our stories, you know, and bring to light those horrific moments in our lives that people can relate to and you can touch their lives, then maybe they don't have to go through what we went through. I mean, that's just... Absolutely. That's the way I see it. You know, so so now you're going to do the Boston Marathon and then what's next? I'm going to take a nap. (laughs) Um, No. (laughs) What's next? I'm going to stay involved with the Heron Project because they're located in Boston. You know, I work full time at the University of Pennsylvania in their School of Medicine doing management work and organizational development. But on the side, what I am trying to start is this nonprofit where it's more of a recovery center and it kind of focuses on physical, mental, spiritual and to work with people in recovery. I mean, because one of the things that I think is missing is that we don't efficiently use resources in the world today. Like, for instance, we have a lot of people who end up in prison, okay? And so they're in prison, and we bring AA meetings in there, and and I think that that's great. But, you know, being in AA, I know that when I really started to feel better, it was because I was helping someone else. So I'm wondering if we can't – like, one of the things I want the group that I'm working with to look at is – can we train up mentors who have been incarcerated, who want to go through steps and get better and then have them work with, because I know, I'm sure you've heard, you know, our veterans come back with traumatic 
experiences, you know, from, you know, when they've put in service in the military. Yeah, PTSD. And not getting, right. And they're not getting what they need. And they're waiting on the phone. So I thought, you know, here we have these people in prison. Okay. And we have this other population, like I, just to even have a hotline where we train up people and they feel like, you know what, while they're in there in prison, they're not just going to sit in an AA meeting, but those that demonstrate a willingness, you know, I think we can start to collaborate on things like that. I think we have to get, you know, the right people in the right mindset, but I think that there's opportunity there to help those two populations. It's actually happening. And the one that I mentioned to you earlier, which was uh, Steve's episode, he was one of the ones that came back from uh, a tour of duty where he suffered from PTSD. Uh, He was self-medicating with alcohol. And so now he actually has started an outreach program for veterans that have PTSD and that also are criminals that have addictive tendencies that are either using drugs and alcohol and putting them through a rehabilitation program instead of incarceration. So it is it's great. It's actually happening. Everything that we're discussing here is no longer just like big picture stuff. There's actually people like yourself that are getting involved and getting behind movements where we're, you know, raising money, you know, helping bring awareness if nothing else, just have a support group and a support website and a support phone number, something that's easy to find and that if you're suffering, you can find help. Whereas before, there wasn't anything like this. Nope. You're exactly right. You had to kind of like fail forward and just kind of you know, stammer around until finally – Somebody says, hey, you know what? You might want to check out one of those AA meetings. But as far as being able to, you know, get stories like we're doing tonight on the podcast and sharing our experience, strength and hope and talking about things that have happened in our lives that others can relate to and then say, oh, I'm going to reach out to this person. Oh, I'm going to reach out to that program right there. That is really, really, really big. And I'm just really excited to be part of it. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And I think, you know, that, you know, it takes time and commitment, but, you know, it comes from the motives are right. And the work that you're doing now, the motives are right. So things will flow and flourish. A hundred percent. That's a beautiful statement. What you just said there is exactly right. It's all about your motives, your intentions. It's like my sponsor used to say, what's behind it? (laughs) (laughs) Because when stuff starts to go south on you, Right. Yep. You know, my sponsor remind me, okay, well, you went wrong somewhere because yep. otherwise it would be working. So you, yeah. need to ch- <laughs> you need to check your motives and you need to check That's your right. ego. And it's true when it's an altruistic endeavor and you're connected with your higher power and you're trying to do, you know, you're trying to be the vessel and do the work that God wants you to do, then it flows. It absolutely flows. And I haven't had to actively seek out someone to be on the show now close to six months. So that just tells me that I'm moving in the right direction. All right. When I first started Mm -hmm. the podcast, I had to take all my friends that were in the rooms and say, (laughs) hey, you mind telling your story on my podcast? What's a podcast? (laughs) That was was the first like six months of me doing this. And then, you know, once I got my rhythm going and a few of them went viral, then all of a sudden I had people that were reaching me and said, hey, I want to be on your show. And since then, it just hasn't stopped. Yeah. It's, say, yeah, awesome it's beautiful. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I always say HP, baby, higher power. <laughs> you got it. That's what it is. All right, Laurie. So let's start closing up here. Okay. So first, let's tell our listeners how they can find you. Tell them about your website, the name of your website, and the best way to contact you. The best way to contact me and all of my information is on. I use primarily Facebook. Okay, and there's a page there called Recovery Management Solutions. It has a phone number, which is, you know, our hotline. It has all of our, you know, information. 
if you need a resource. And basically what we try and do is to offer what we call strengths-based coaching and to give you, you know, resources that are right at your fingertips. We don't promote any one particular type of, you know, recovery because we try to be open, but all of our information, you know, is right there. It's easy enough on Facebook. And like I said, there's a number, there's an email. And honestly, like the people who have come to me, again, it didn't happen necessarily through Facebook. It really, I mean, God works in incredible ways. You know, when someone, you know, reaches out and says, oh God, please help me, you know, the help will come. So, you know, that's where we are in terms of recovery management solutions. And also there you will find the work that I'm doing with the Heron Project. And there's a link there because there's still time to donate for the uh, Boston Marathon. So you can click on that link. If you want to get involved with the Heron Project, just send me a message on the Facebook page there. And I'd be happy to connect you with the individuals in the Heron Project. They're doing so many incredible things. They're also now affiliated with what is called the Icebreaker Run. And people are going to be running literally around the United States, probably in May. And each person's going to take a leg of the race and it's called the icebreaker. And this is strictly to raise funds to break the stigma around addiction and mental health issues. I believe that I like to be a repository of information. So I'll always try and post something up, you know, each week about what's going on in the recovery community. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I'm going to have that information on the show notes. It's beautiful what you're doing, Lori. It's very exciting to watch how so many of us are getting on board with getting the message out to as many people as possible, the ones that are desperate to find a solution and just don't know where to turn. We're making it easy for them. So I love it. I love it. All right. So now as we close up, we're going to close up for the newcomer. I'm going to ask you five questions about your early recovery, and I want you to answer with some insightful, inspiring answers that you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, so number one, what was keeping you from getting clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? I think it's twofold. I think that I had an incredible physical addiction and I didn't go to detox. I didn't go to rehab. So the physical situation was challenging. The other thing was I did not want to not drink. I mean, a year before I got sober, I made a prayer to God and I said, God, please do me a favor. Just make me a social drinker. And you know what? That was not in God's plan, quite obviously. (laughs) I never not wanted to drink. Like I wanted to find a way where every day I'd be able to have alcohol. I mean, that's just, that's the insanity of of who I am, you know? So that, and then once you realize that deep down, because you know, I believe anyway, you know, deep down. Absolutely. I couldn't admit it. I couldn't. Like, how could this be? How could this be me? You know, I criticized my father. I criticized other people. I was judgmental. I mean, the ego, the pride, okay, pride, that's what I would say. Pride held me back. Absolutely. It does that for so many of us. Somebody in the rooms would say, the ego is not my amigo. Ah, (laughs) That's exactly right. (laughs) All right. So it's true. It's very true. All right. So, number two, (laughs) at what point did you have? That spiritual awakening, that aha moment in recovery when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol, but for the first time had developed the hope that you could recover. I think after I had stopped drinking, I was, you know, traveling for work. I had to go to Argentina and I got there. I don't really speak Spanish very well. And I went in, I think I was three months sober. I got to my room that they got me. It was gorgeous. And I opened it up and it was all the little vodka bottles. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) And, oh, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't curse. No, 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 no. You can curse. This is going to be a nightmare. So I called the woman who was sponsoring me at the time because this is before Nick. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got a mini bar. And she was like, oh, I'm not worried. I'm like, you're not. I said, well, how does that work that you're not worried? 
And she said, well, I know that you know how to pray. And I'm telling you right now, at that moment, I got down on my knees and I said, God, I don't want to drink this. What am I going to do? And the next thing you know, I went out. It was like an out-of-body experience. I went out and I said to the, I wrote down to the front desk because I didn't know how to say alcoholic in Spanish. So I said, listen, I'm an alcoholic. Can you please take out the alcohol of my room, please? And that was like, oh, oh, so sorry, so sorry. And next thing you know, out they go with all the, the bottles. So I go back in and I said, just put water in there. But they left one bottle, right? And I brought it right back out. And that, to me, that was it. I was like, you know what? That woman told me I know how to pray. I prayed. And the next thing you know, I'm honest and they're getting rid of the alcohol. Honestly, that for me was like, I'm powerless over this. This is going to always be around, but I have God. And I believe that for me, what comes between me and taking a drink is my relationship with God. God is always there for me. Always there. Always has been. I walk away from him sometimes. Holy cow, man, that is a great aha moment. I was right there, right there with you. It's so unbelievably powerful, that moment of clarity, and you have that instinctual response. And if you don't follow your gut, it's almost like the clock starts ticking. You know, you just moved, you know, it was like, get these bottles out of my hotel room, right? You just acted. And that is such a beautiful thing because I think for so many, they're waiting for that white light experience or a burning bush or God to speak to them. But it's just that you get that fleeting thought, that good next right thing, fleeting thought, and you act on it. And you recognize that your gut's working now in the right way. Yeah. God spoke to me through a mini bar. That is spectacular. He tried to speak to uh, Denzel Washington in flight, but uh, he didn't listen. <laughs> Did you see that movie? <laughs> Did you? Yes. Oh, God. I saw that movie and I just remember going, wow, they did a beautiful depiction of what it's like to be a drug addict. Mm-hmm. It was terrifying. So number three, you mentioned earlier Breathing Underwater uh, by the Franciscan monk. Uh, Richard Rohr. Other than that book, okay, that you've already mentioned, what books would you recommend to uh, newcomers in early recovery? Oh, as a newcomer, I can only tell you from my experience, it took me a really long time, probably two years to read and be able to like really kind of embrace it, retain it. So early on, I found like I couldn't get overloaded with things. I couldn't be reading too many different things. So I really stuck with the literature that was in the rooms, and I I really benefited from those daily devotionals because they were short, and I could retain it, and it was just like a little shot. It was a little, and you know, I was used to taking shots, so it's a little <laughs> shot every day, right? right? And I tried to work it that way, like daily reflections, and that you know, for me, that twenty four hour day book because it has a thought for the day prayer for the day and then a meditation. And even when I couldn't completely understand what was said or what was going on, it settled me. It settled me. I didn't have the race and race and race. And so those devotionals were very, very helpful. And, you know, I mean, I think the stories in the big book are great. You know, I believe that it's important to read through the first 165 pages. And the only reason why I say that is because it was a beautiful experience for me. That's you know, I don't know that that's the right way, but it worked for me. And so I think the early on, the other book that made sense to me, I remember this, was uh, the, uh, it's called The Twelve and Twelve. And I learned later that that was really kind of Bill's walk through the steps, Bill W. Um, so that was great. Beautiful. Um, but, you know, yeah. So I think it's hard enough for newcomers you know, than to labor them with a whole lot of reading. But I think, you know, just, you know, do a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Beautiful. And so on that note, what is the best suggestion you have ever received? 
connect with an alcoholic every day, a recovering alcoholic every day. Yes, it works. And I, when I'm struggling, or when I was struggling early on, I would just text. I was never so grateful for texting. And I would text someone and just say, just checking in. And they'd text right back. (laughs) I mean, it was just like, you know, and it's free. Yep. It's free. (laughs) I mean, I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on therapy. And I used to drink before and after therapy. You know what I'm saying? I do. (laughs) Craziness. (laughs) But it's true. All right. And then the final question, number five. If you could give a newcomer only one suggestion, what would it be? If you decide and you have to decide, you will never have to hurt like you have hurt from drugs or alcohol. If you decide to begin the path of recovery. Man, that's beautiful. I love it. Amazing suggestions, Lori. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for helping me stay sober today. (laughs) Ditto. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, folks, we've now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step fellowship as a whole. And though we discuss 12-step recovery and the impact it had in our lives, we do not promote or endorse any 12-step anonymous program.